So today we are going to be, uh, the salon is, it's October 9th. My name is Elizabeth Goodwill. I'm the education director here at Art Center Sarasota. And we have our special guest of Carl Abbott. Who's going to be? Uh, we're going to have a nice little discussion on his um, sculptural forms. He's going to talk a little about his architecture, but it's more of the sculptural forms that we have um, in building right now. Um, and we're going to be having a, an exhibition uh, in a long, in um, I guess with sixth, seventh, eighth. Yeah, November. it's sixth, seventh, and eighth of November for Mod Weekend right. um, through the Sarasota Architectural Foundation. And they have, um, have a, us having an exhibit of Carl's sculptures and we will be doing, and then the Sarasota Art Museum has an exhibit of, um, I'm not sure what, what exactly. Basically architecture. It's architecture, okay, that, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And yeah. then Carl will be doing a talk on um, Friday the 6th um, with Anne Marie. It's Zoom, I think, or video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do believe it, yeah. it is yeah. going to be Zoomed. Yeah. Um, tickets are available right now. If you go to the Sarasota Architectural Foundation, you can, or search for Mod Weekend Sarasota 2020, you can find, um, find the tickets. And there will also be a lot of tours walk around the building tours. Yes. And so you can get all the information. From they're the doing a, a walking tour, um, a driving tour, and a kayak tour. Yes. Which I was yes. like, that's, that's kind of really, that's really yes. interesting. Yes. But um, we're doing this um, just kind of to start off the, the kick for Mod Weekend, and we're excited to have Carl back again. Um, Thank you. Carl is not only is he a, an amazing sculptor and enters work in our, our shows, he has been um, been here for for many years. How many years have you been a member? No, I said to you 50, and I think that's right. <laughs> yeah. Not the whole life of not the, business, the whole but life, yeah. about half. Okay? Yes, well, no, it's not 95, right? No, no, <laughs> not quite. No, not quite. Well, here's a little about Carl. I'm going to read my little script. Um, so Sarasota Mod 2020 is going to be celebrating Carl, and he is most uh, one of the most highly awarded architects in Florida and the Caribbean. Uh, his sculpture is exhibited and has received awards in many shows, including here at Art Center Sarasota. Carl's designs have a timeless, modern quality that is strongly informed by his experiences of the sacred architecture of the ancient Mayans and the Egyptians specifically in the manner in which their designs respond to the land and to the movement of the sun. Carl's outlook is international and well-informed. Having practiced and taught in Europe, the Caribbean, and the Pacific Islands, um, he received his master's degree in architecture from Yale uh, and, and uh, studied under Paul Rudolph. Um, and on opening his office in Sarasota, became uh, an original member of the Sarasota School of Architecture, which Art Center Sarasota is one of those buildings. And we have actually a few in this uh, strip of buildings right here. Yes. here. We got the Chitsey Library and the Victor Lundy uh, Pagoda Building. Right. And um, so Carl continues to keep his Sarasota firm small to allow for close personal involvement in each project. And we're going to see a little of that involvement today. Um, and a book he has um, that is available at Barnes and Noble and Amazon uh, is called Informed by the Land. And you should definitely pick it up if you haven't already. All right. So Carl. Let's go to the first image. And if you could make your image as large of the image, not of us, that would be great. Yeah, the larger the image, the better the impact you're going to have. Right, right. The first image you're looking at there, I've shown it to a number of people, and I've got many comments on what they think it is. And so look at it for a moment, and we'll talk about it later. Uh, thank you for joining us. That's a great honor to be here. It's a great honor to be involved in all, certainly the center here, and also in the mod that's coming up. It's a great honor, and I'm amazingly grateful for this. This is a wonderful. I'd like to go into some 
some thoughts on the process I, I use. And again, we all have many of the same processes, but we have our own way of looking at the world. And I think that's one of the real attributes, goals, hopes of being in the visual arts, whether it's architecture, painting, sculpture, is that you present the world to others through your eyes. And to me, that's, we're all very unique and we see things very differently. I would like to start with just showing some images of some buildings that have informed me amazingly throughout my whole life. One of the first is a building I loved when I was a kid, photographs of this building. This is in Egypt. It's the temple of Hatshepsut. And I'm, some of you may have been there, hope so. I, the reason I went to Egypt was to see this building basically. And I went there about 10 years ago and it's well worth the trip. It's an amazing structure. It's been very influential to many, many architects. And I'll show you a project we did not long ago that has a very strong reference to this building. Next is a building in uh, Yucatan, the Maya civilization I will talk about because it's really affected me in a very strong way. It's informed me in a lot of ways. And this is a temple called Yushalan, it's a city called Yushalan. You have to go there by canoe on the Yucenta River and it's right at the border of Guatemala and Mexico. And I had a, a, a guide with me and we spent several days, well, we spent out, we're out two weeks on that trip looking at different sites. This is an amazing site. Next is uh, the temple of, of it's the, the governor's palace at Ushmal, which is one of the great buildings of the world. Frank Lloyd Wright had never seen it, but seen Wright read photographs of the building and he considered it one of the world's great, great buildings. I mean, I can't, just I could, I've done talks on this building and there are books done on this building. This building is around 200 feet long. You see the scale of people. This was done around seven to 900 after Christ. But if you look at the top section of this building, it's very heavy with ornament, with, with, with sculpture. It's heavier than the bottom section. That This is all very thought out, very methodically worked. The, the top is reading is heavy, pushing down. And yet in these gaps between the three sections of the building, there are arches that shoot upwards. So there are, there are amazing things happening. The spacing of the doors are all symmetrical coming from one end to the other. They're all different, the spacings of the, of the doors. Amazingly, amazing amount of thought has gone into this building. And I'll talk more about the Maya in a few minutes. Next is this wonderful building that I think most everybody knows or knows of it. It's Ranchamp by Corbusier done in the 40s, 50s. One of the world's great, great buildings of any time and time in the world. Next, this is Falling Water. Again, if you haven't been there, you should go. It's, a, it's owned by the Pennsylvania Conservancy. You can go, you have to get tickets ahead, but it's truly more important than the photographs you see, walking around this and seeing how this building really grows out of the earth. It's, an, it's truly earth shaking, this building, a, a mind shaking, not earth shaking. So <laughs> that's another subject. Another Next is a beautiful, courtyard at Salk Center by Louis Kahn. And this, we saw the models of this when I was at Yale in Louis Kahn's office in Philadelphia, we saw the models. And I've been to the building three or four different times and each time it's better. That in the distance is the Pacific. I mean, this is this amazing courtyard. This is a laboratory, it's a salt research center, the polio guy. <laughs> and this is his center. And it is, it's staggeringly beautiful. It's just amazing. Next is a wonderful building. This is not a very good print of this photograph, but this is the Deering House by Paul Rudolph. Again, a very wonderful building, very influenced by some of the projects that Wright had done with concrete block where they were stacked in these fins, knife edge shapes again. And also uh, it has a reference to Hatshepsut, the temple in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the buildings that have informed me a great lake. Next is an image of the Bombax tree. And I think everybody knows this tree. If you don't, you certainly should. We can grow them here. In fact, Leslie, I've got one for you and Steve. Yes, it's coming that I air layered or mark it. But <laughs> this is a, an amazing tree that grows here. And it's one of my, it's my favorite flowering tree. It blooms January, February. There are other amazing trees here that we have, the jacarandas, then the gold trees. I mean, they're staggeringly beautiful. 
And right now, the Carissia trees, which is a cousin of this tree, a relative's thorny trunk, bright pink flowers. You'll see a few around town. There are not many of them. They're big trees, and they, people think they're cherry blossoms. Well, we don't have cherries here. We have Carissias. Okay? So, but to see these, you can see the seasons changing by the landscape. I started to study to be a landscape architect. So the landscape clearly affects the way I see buildings and the way I do buildings are affected by the fact that I've been into sculpture and, and painting. So these are all part of my process. Next. Okay. I'd like to show you a few of our projects. I've mentioned a few things that, that I really love to see in buildings and in art and sculpture and everything. It's things that have change, change with the seasons, change the way you look at them. Like you think of a knife edge form. And that's a form that can be straight and you see it straight ahead or you see it from the side. They're totally different things. And I love the fact that it, you want to see it changing. And in fact, some of the sculpture that we were still do, working on for the show here at the Art Center in a few weeks, we don't have a lot of time, but in a few weeks, <laughs> it's, we're playing with this where you look at it one way and it looks like it's solid and you look at it another way, it's not even there, it's just a thin edge. And I love this. So you'll see this in my buildings. I also love to have in buildings the sense of spontaneity so that it looks as though it just almost happened. It was a piece of nature. That to me is a goal of architecture. And one of the concerns with architecture is you go through so many layers of, of input, information. You're informed in so many ways. It's wonderful, but it's also a slow, slow process. You have the land, you have the client who you give you critical input for the design of a building. And then you have the engineers you work with, the structural, mechanical, lighting, acoustical. Then you have the contract, you have the permits. Then you get it built and hopefully it has some life and spontaneity. That's always a goal for me with architecture and with sculpture. Next, this is again an interior of the summer house as a, when it was a restaurant, it's a clubhouse now. Um, but you can see we were playing with, this is in the mid seventies. We're playing a lot with curved forms then and, and nautical forms and a lot of I've been told, and I think that's definitely true from my own background. Next, we're gonna go through a number of these very fast. This is part of the entry to our, our St. Thomas More Complex that's in Gulfgate. And we worked on that project for over 30 years we're doing many different, so a number of different buildings. And a number of these buildings are going to be walk around buildings for the tour that's coming up. And we're doing videos on those that are really fun because each video will be like a three to five minute video on each of uh, 12 plus projects. And there'll be me talking about why the building's the way it is. There will be photographs from our book and other professional photographs of the project. And then there will be current photographs, videos of the exterior of the buildings and drone photos. So each, each video is very fun. They're just sort of a process, explaining process. Yeah. This is that same church working with a captured garden. It's on 20 acres of land with a whole series of captured gardens. Again, tying nature right back in. Your focus is nature, not inside, it's outside. Mm -hmm. The same complex. A whole series of buildings, a chapel, a church, different forms. Next. A house we did, again, in the 80s, very different from a lot of the buildings we were doing. This is all basically wood, and it's a floating building. And that was the intent, that it to be very light and delicate it's on the beach, but it's, it's, it's almost floating. And we have one other image of that, and you can see the interior is very light, full, full of sunlight, changing with the seasons. It was a winter home. So it, and it's very small, it's about 2000 square feet of interior space, about that much of terraces on all levels. Next. Pineview School, uh, this is like 50 some odd acres, 14 buildings. A number of them are prefab buildings, but there's some very special custom buildings. I was a design architect at WR, WR Frizzell at Fort Myers with the architect record. This was done about 27 years ago. And the, it was based on the concept of the central green that Thomas Jefferson used with his lawn at the University of Virginia. And there's a woods at the far end. The building I want to speak about is, is the one that's this one. It's, it's the media center. It's the ways down on one side. 
It's a very tall building. It has a reference to the rotunda at the University of Virginia. It's an abstract reference, but it is a reference. And this is an interior shot of that. They're looking back at the woods in there and the ceiling sweeps and slopes upwards. And there's a, a wall. You don't expect this closing off on second level mechanical room. And that's painted very bright purple, not blue, but purple. So <laughs> it's rather unexpected to see that form in there. So. Hmm? Oh. I just wanted, I'm jumping now, okay. like, like I'm going to be jumping. You're going to be jumping, yeah, yeah. and just, and we're going to go into sculpture now from, from Yes, I want to show you some pieces of sculpture I've been working with. This was actually done at the University of Florida, one of the, one of the art courses, sculpture courses I'd taken. And as you see, I was working with rounded forms, not that dissimilar from some of the things I'm doing now, but they were not the vibrant blue at all. <laughs> so, no, they, they were but that's a it's a process that's a process it's we process have, we're talking about yes, okay. yes okay. but it, it is interesting to how the the relation of your architectural forms to your sculptural forms as they evolve so this was what circa 1960 late 50s late 50s and you were, we are, most of the sculpture that we did in metal or i did in metal are very rounded shapes and it's not, not only that i like the shape but there were in those days the university did not have fancy garbage cans they had just just oil cans. That was the garbage cans. And at night, a lot of those got missed, were found <laughs> missing. And they wound up in the sculpture <laughs> department. And so we already had rounded shapes to start with. I was not the only one who did that. There were a number of us. Okay. Metal is metal. Metal is metal. Okay. <laughs> and then the next is another piece of the universe, again, in the late 50s. Again, working with steelies or knife edged forms played together. And this is about foot and a half high terracotta, which is a job to bake it and get it not to bust on you, as you all know. But these were done as separate pieces and that you then anchor together into this three-dimensional form. Yeah, and this piece especially, I can see how it relates both even closer to your architecture and to your current sculptural forms. It, it does, it really does relate yeah. in a way I didn't realize until I started looking at these things later. Yeah. And they're, so, yeah, definitely. This is why archives are a great thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is the show up in Dunedin that um, I think most all of you from the Art Center came up for the show. We did. It was an amazing it, show. It wasn't just me. It was a whole number of artists from the center here. Mm -hmm. There were five art artists chosen. Yes. Several of us were sculptors. And I was chosen because of a piece that was shown here. And um, it got a ribbon in the show. And the curator, who was the jury here, invited me to be in the show there. And I talked about the piece. And he wanted me to do a cluster of pieces. And so we came up with this Maya symbols, uh, uh, stations of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the compass, north, east, south, and west. Each of these four pieces has this, a shape that's different once you get in it. They actually have an east. E W N S in the shape of the <laughs> cuts in them. They're very subtle, but they are there. There, and you can see the scale of them. These will be done here. I like how this one. The way that you set it up was that people are supposed to walk through it, interact with it. Because Interacting. Of, yes. And Nathan, the curator up there, he and I set this up. We worked on this. I talked about it later when we had a talk up there that we did this like I would work as an architect with him. He said, he told me he wanted central. I said, but it's simpler, it's going to be too dominant. He said, no, I want it central. So that you see the other artwork through yours and yours we walk through. So we worked together and we set it around four outlets, some of which showed, but so we, there were things <laughs> we were bound with. And and in just, I'm sorry, but it's the detail, but the bamboo in the middle, I kept very concerned about that falling over and we have it anchored pretty well, but I had to call Nathan a number of times before the show opened. And I said, Nathan, I'm really concerned. We really need to do more to anchor that. He said, this is only going to be here for about a month. You're thinking of it being here for 20 years. No, you're an architect. <laughs> no it's not things. going to fall. Don't worry about it. So, and it didn't fall. Now, it did not now fall. did you find as you were standing in the gallery that people were actually walking yes. through the space? Oh yeah. That's great. They weren't intimidated by no, it. No, people walked in. It was big enough. We had it big enough to get, it was actually ADA. So you could actually go wheel, wheel you know, yeah, we, we gotta we gotta conform to those, oh, yes, those yes, guidelines, yes, yes, which yes, is yes. necessary. So it worked that way. Right. Okay, just go ahead. 
This is a piece I did very recently. Um, I was in a show spinning, which it does spin, and I'm probably spending too much time on these, but let me just comment. This was informed clearly by Deschamps' wheel, bicycle wheel, and I had a, a bicycle that I'd saved since 40 some odd years of my younger son's bike that he learned to ride on finally. It was like a miracle because he kept trying and didn't make it and then finally he just took off on the bicycle. And so I saved the bicycle <laughs> and I wanted to give it to him. And I thought about painting the whole thing blue, but that's pretty big. And then I was in New York to do some talks in December, went through the modern, the new wing very quickly. I saw the Duchamp and I had seen it. There were several versions of it actually. And I read about it originally the wheels did spin. It's sitting on a stool. And I thought, this is really interesting. Maybe I can do something out of Mark's bike to yeah. have a reference. And this is a variation on that. <laughs> and it's painted bright blue, which Duchamp did not do, but he had this, uh, the, a lot of elements. And I call this uh, Dada 100 plus, all in reference to Duchamp. <laughs> this is a motor. And I love the shape and as you see it and you move around it, it's totally different and I like to move it. I originally, it was in a show here and I had it horizontal. I later decided that was totally wrong. It belongs to a friend, Tim, I gave it to him, and it worked better vertically. It works better vertically anyway, you can put it horizontal. Well, you, you come into the shows every so often and you'll just rearrange your Yes, sculptures. I do arrange my pieces <laughs> when they're here. It's not legal, but I go in and, and change them and I put, often put a sign, touch. Yeah, or move. We'll come around the corner and go, wait, it wasn't di that direction right. earlier. Right. Right. Carl's been here. <laughs> okay. We're going to have to speed up here. Yes, we are. Okay. This is another piece that was in a show, Tongs, which has certainly a reference to Oldenburg. And this should be about two stories high. That's a reference. And a pond. Okay. I like that idea. Okay. This is one I call Shell. And we're working on two more of these right now. Actually, tomorrow we're doing a lot of work on there. They're not that big. They're about 12 inches by 12 inches, and you can sit in any direction. And what I like about this is sometimes it's a knife edge, and sometimes it's a big flat plane, and it's simply bent metal. It's, again, or a Tommy, using that word. And I get a shape I like, and then I sit it on a stand, and then I kind of study it, and then with blue tape, I mark things I like or don't like, and will stress the material with pliers or with a, with a, with a, um, with a, um, what do you call it? Mallet. A mallet, a heavy mallet, a sledgehammer mallet. <laughs> and, 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 and then they kind of form, form their own shapes. And some I like, some I don't like. And the shapes I like, I let that inform what we're doing. And so I find it, it very fun. And the color changes constantly. This very intense blue that Leslie was just mentioning it changes totally in the light. It does. I mean, With, but it's in the fact that it's use, you're using a flat blue. It's flat. Yes. So I don't, I don't like shiny things in principle, but it's flat. And so it, 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 it really does catch shadows beautifully and it's always, always changing. Yes. And you can move the piece, you can turn that piece upside down, it still works. Okay. This is a piece that Johnny and Elliot uh, photograph they did of the, of the steely they own that was in the uh, Dunedin show that's going to be in the show here but that's a, the kind of detail that you can study in these that they're really forms that are found in the material itself that I've accentuated or have gone with or not gone with and so it's finding the forms and that whole name of the show we went through a lot of thoughts Janet and Elliot and I and a lot of people for the show here and the word really mean found forms means a lot of things to me. It means forms that you found in nature, forms that you found and then went along with and developed, or as an architect, elements in the land itself, the sun, the way the sun changes with the seasons. All these are layers to, to me of finding forms or forms found. So that's, you can don't go back and forth. I'm going to jump now, really. How are we doing? We're doing good. We're good. Okay. 24 minutes. Okay. Uh, I would like to show you, jump back to the Maya. And let me talk for a moment here about the Maya. I've been very fortunate. I've been to Egypt. I spent a good bit of time in the 60s in, in Greece when it was safe to climb, you know, sleep on beaches and lived in youth hostels for like two months in Greece. A lot of studying, you know, site studying in Italy, but mainly in Greece. And then later in Egypt. And then I've been to Angkor Wat's. 
And so I've been to and Machu Picchu, which is amazing. I've been to some amazing sites. The Maya sites, and they're all very different, all very different, is one of the things that's so appealing to the Maya world to me is they basically were looking at the world from their buildings are through their buildings. Whereas in Greece, to me, in Greece, and even in Egypt, most often it's the view, yes, to nature, but it's most often to a hearth or a tabernacle or an inner courtyard. Mm -hmm. So it's more man-oriented. To me, the Maya world is more looking at nature, looking at the sun, the movement of the sun, the shadows the sun makes, the 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 you know the ripples off of water that you get in the trees and on the building so all these the mice played with these things amazing even the sound of wind going through the windows or openings at certain seasons they played with i'm told i don't have never seen that but i've heard the, that one too yeah but in a chichen this is some many of you've been there this is this amazing huge what 15 story pyramid with this railing on the staircase four staircases and the one staircase during the equinox fall and spring the shadow of the snake undulates a paw down this wall yeah this is amazing architects don't do these sort of things but the maya did and so it's amazing how they work with natural forms and they also work with heavy forms and then there were lighter forms inside them or very articulated forms and then here i am all these thousand plus years later, and so many buildings that I have done are heavy, protective on the outside or on when there is a backside or to the road, and very delicate on the inside, very glass, so very open, almost like a clamshell. Now, that doesn't apply to every part building, but it does apply to many buildings that we've worked on in churches, schools, uh, residences, whatever. Um, so, so there's some ties with the Maya that to me are very great. The other is the land in the Yucatan is exactly like the floor, like a land here in South Florida. It it's karst formation with little hillocks, mm -hmm. it's land limestone. Um, so the, and the plant material in the Yucatan Peninsula is very like here. Now, when you get to Guatemala, you're in jungles with monkeys and the rest. But <laughs> but but and it's and panthers, the whole everything. I mean, it's it's pretty wild in some of those areas. But Yucatan is the land is very similar to here, mm -hmm. very similar. This one you asked me, Elizabeth. This is a. Yeah, this one is. This is one that I, you probably heard of. This. This is called Tonina, and it's way down in Chiapas in Mexico, and it's a jungle. It's jungle around that, not right at that site. But this is again one of the last of the Maya sites because it was so far away and so protected in the mountains mm -hmm. that the Spaniards really came much. This, there were still people living near this when the Spaniards came. It had already passed its high peak which was around 800, 900, and the Spaniards came, what, 1500. So the Maya had already passed. The Incas and some of the others were very active when the, when the Spaniards came, but the Maya were not. Yeah. And one of the Maya civilizations, one of the reasons it's not destroyed is because there was no gold. The Mayas didn't, didn't worship gold. They worshiped nature colors. Turquoise was more important to them than gold. Yes. And they traded with the American Indians for turquoise. Which is why we have the sky gems. So, yes. yes. It's so it's, it's just amazing all the differences. But this is an amazing, it's one pyramid that is a city. And it underlates across this whole whole hillock. It's a, and it's, it's, I know, but, the, but this is like, this picture is misleading. This is a big structure. It's huge. It's like five or six stories high from the ground, yeah. the high point. And it's a whole series of pyramids that come together to make one pyramid. To make one giant city structure. It's a city. Yeah. It's a city. It's quite, quite amazing. It's not the most beautifully articulated ones, but it's a beautifully articulated and thought out, but still spontaneous city. But it was built for hundreds of years. And it also kind of like emulates the way those hills. Yes, and the hills around yeah. it worked. It's it's amazing. And it was a long way out of the way, but it was well worth going there. Yes. All right, this is, now we go from the giant scale of the Maya, and this is carved on a bone. I saw this piece smaller than the image, probably, well, probably on your TV screen. And these are called the paddle gods. And if you can see the name, it's probably tiny, but there's a parrot god, there's a iguana god. They're all sort of different gods here. And there are other 
depictions of the paddle gods on canoes that are sinking. <laughs> They're halfway. I mean, there's a whole symbolism. There's there's a wit in this. There's there's a whole range of things that read to me in this that are sort of from these pyramids to this scale. Next. This is a conch shell. Next. This is a very famous, a little bit smaller than, well, not life size, but a little smaller, of Pical in at Palenque. This is absolutely beautiful. And you've got to realize the Maya had no connection except way, way back to, to Asia, but they had no connection to Asia or the, the current at the, uh, what, around Christ time. They had no connection with Asia or Europe. And yet they came up with these forms that relate to what we're doing. And yet they're seeing it in a different way. They're seeing the world differently. And to them, everything they made and touched and trees were sacred, which is very different from the European approach where it's more oriented towards man. Asia has much of this, but I have never seen it the way the Mayas do it. Next. This is, I'm gonna move very quickly. This is about six inches long. It's a light in stone, it's called. That's a carving around 500 after Christ, roughly. This is a drawing of it and then next. This is like, here's the drawing again. And it, look at the person there, the, the, the captive right there. Look at the bottom, the one on the bottom over there. So you can see this is a collage basic of all the different elements. And the Maya did this with most of their work. They would put layers of symbolism over each other. And they had a written language and all these amazing other things. Let's get out of the Maya because <laughs> I could spend easily. Oh, we're still here. Okay. We're still here. This is an amazing site that I love and have been to a couple, well, one time with a wonderful archaeologist, Tomas. And this is on a hill, about a four story hill in a big pasture. This is called Skishmuk. And you go up the hill, and then right in front of you is this next, that's showing the height, it's about 64 feet. Next image. This is the building, and then the next image. That's the same image with a circle, red circle about a person. Right. This is six stories high. And it's been, this was in 20... No, not 1890, uh, 1898. Yeah, it was a Peabody study. In fact, I, our Thomas got me these drawing photographs because I, I wanted more about the site. But what I loved about this, it was actually it's not a city, it was a big estate, basically. Very wealthy estate uh, for a noble, whatever. And this, the back side of the building is very fortress-like, very solid. You go around the opposite side and everything is very articulated, very broken down in scale. So it very, to me, relates to the way I approach architecture. Often we'll have these very solid forms that are then on the opposite side will be totally different, totally articulated. Mm -hmm. I'd like to start you, this, you know, we're almost there. Oh, yeah, okay. no. This is this is a Chichen, this is the, Many of you have been there, I'm sure. A wonderful site that, that the archaeologists really want to want. There's so much to see there and to do there yet that hadn't been such huge city, very late Maya, around 1,000. Uh, they were gone before the Spaniards came, you know, 1592, 1600, early 1600. Anyway, what I want you to see is it's like at Chachatou uh, uh, in Egypt. They're columns that are not really needed, and they're thin shaped columns, very wide on one side and narrow on the other. They could easily have omitted the one in the middle, but they're using it for symbolic reasons. They wanted this to look very strong and powerful. Again, this is part of the ball court at, in, in uh, Chichen. Yeah, and then let's go to the next image. This is a project we did. I want to show you some projects that we did. and. Um, you were asking me. Yeah, I, well, so you talked about these knife edges, and so we just saw those those pillars, um, and at the ball court, and then we've got these window yep. edges here. Now, are those you didn't didn't need to add those? You could have just made a yes. Plate we glass. didn't have to do it, but I wanted to have the articulation there. Yeah. To hold the form together. This is a mansion. It's not a right. It's not a residential scale. This is a mansion. It's one of the biggest residential projects we've done. And it's got a huge acreage. And uh, so that we're working with this in a very different manner. There's a formal approach. We have a large wall there that you get the knife edge and then it changes, you move around it. Yes, as you said, those forms are ones they look solid when you're at a distance and the closer you get, they start opening up. Yeah. So that's repeated through the building and the form you're seeing over there 
uh, with your cursor, those are actually slots in the building. So you get rays of light from those instead of fins of light, you get rays of light. This is part of the interior. Again, you can see those fins. And the next, this is the main space there. And you can see it's very open, but it's got these huge fins that, that reach full 20 some foot high. And you can see the bridge in the interior. So large living space there, huge art collection. The people had art galleries. And so there's a lot is to show art too as well. And the other thing we're playing with with nature that I learned both I think as a kid and seeing some of the things with the Maya world is the ricocheting of sunlight. And when the sun hits the water in the morning and winter here, the rays often, not every day, but they'll hit the water and bounce back and ricochet and shimmer on that ceiling. Mm -hmm. And we've all seen this when we go in the woods, sometimes the water, if you're near water, there's shimmer in the, in the ceilings yes. or in the trees, actually, to tree plant. Exactly. And that so it's dappled playing. light. It's a dappled light. Yes. And it's playing with the movement of light. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just sunlight, it's the way the world changes with the sun. And, and, and as Leslie, who's in our group here today, knows, we have their main room facing the winter solstice. And Steve has called me most winter solstice and said, it's still working. Tell your Maya <laughs> friends. The Maya certainly worked with the equinoxes and they knew it. They were the, they were the most advanced astronomers of any past civilization. So I'm also looking at this picture in here where you have the the stairs yes. and this curve of the water yes. to emulate almost like that the waveform, but you're working with different materials to go from one that the windows don't exist. Right. The windows are just there. There. Yeah. there. And, and this is, we're getting into real detail here, but <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> we don't even have the frame. So we've eaten the frame so your mm -hmm. eye doesn't get caught by the frame holding the glass. We found that into the column. Exactly. And I wanted it to do, and it was, anyway, yes. <laughs> that, was, that was a big thing we were pushing. Very quickly, this is a couple of images of project in the Dutch Antilles, and it was right at the top of a hill, and very much the building dot grows out of the site this roof form really floats. It's the top of this little development and right straight to the ahead of you is the Caribbean to the south and the island of Siba is out there too that you see sometimes and other times it's gone in the mist. So we're playing with nature clearly for the whole focus of this building. That's a pool at the upper level of the building. It's got six levels in this building. It's not a huge house, but it's played a lot and pulled out across the land. Next. This is a house, this is a Butterfield house, Leslie and Steve and John's house. And it's, it's a very tall building because we put as, the, as Leslie and Steve wanted, we wanted the living room on the top level because of the view. And you can get the view across to the Gulf. If you're not there, we have an elevator, we have stairs that are fun to go up. And I think you call it, it's choreographed to go around the building. Next image is you approach the building from back here. So the building, in fact, we were working on this, the guys in the office said, you have a pyramid form. Look, it's a truncated pyramid. You have one height and then it steps up. There's another height. There's another height. So there's a pyramid form, you know, like a half of a pyramid form, which is kind of happening on its own here. Okay. Yes. But again, this is a project. I was a design architect. Leo Leonardi is the architect of record. We worked together closely on this as we've done on a couple of other projects. Okay. Very rapidly. This is another project that I want to show you for a specific reason. And this is Again, all concrete block, uh, so it really grows out of the seashell. It's on one of the islands, Barry Islands here. Paul Rudolph had done the first house for the same family, and then I did it uh, after the husband had died. They had picked me to do the house, and then he said, when I had died, you knew, sorry. They had, it's a client, a couple who had a very important house by Paul Rudolph. And they told me, they had me to dinner with my wife, this is a long time ago, and they said, they, he said, within a, within a number of months, I will not be living. And I want you to do a house for Lucille. We know you will respect Rudolph's work. There are a lot of things that this house would like to tie into a new house for her. I'd like her to be on the bay and not on the beach. And I want you to help her pick a site. And so we did. This all happened just as he said. And we have a lot of things we incorporated from that house. It's a very different house. It's, it's the other's a palace, really. And this is a much smaller house. 
and it's sort of using that concrete block, which I love in a different way. Uh, again, a couple more. One of the things I want to show you specifically with this, this is the big room is the triangle. And it's you enter to a very low ceiling and then you come into the living room. Go back just a minute. You go to the living room, which is a double ceiling, the dining room and the kitchen are all the lower ceiling, all the same floor plan. But the view from here, it's a regular piece of property and the view is up, no look at north east up the bay and so we're, we've got as close to the water as the code would let us get and it's a mangrove area so you get water there sometime but often you don't get water but you get these mangroves the black mangroves which you see in the middle which are just like little oak trees they're beautiful but just not blocking the water but but let me go back you have this triangular space right here working with a setback really setbacks on two sides and the other side is an irregular but a very tight setback so we wound up with this triangular form of a room and i'm convinced when you're in a room that's that's not rectangle or square which most of us are used to be in being in if it's possible your eye the back of your brain whatever will try to find that other corner that's the red dot you see out there but when you're looking you don't see the red dot, you're thrown out into the view. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of getting you to be more involved in the land and the views. And that we've done on a number of projects so that we have elements that, that are not there, but your eye tries to find them. Yeah, and taking into consideration the fact of the natural world and you know utilizing the, trying to not remove everything and then put it back in or exactly and leave it out sometimes often the most beautiful thing is you have a rhythm and then you leave a column out yeah and you break the rhythm mm -hmm. you give it a life that way yes so that's the same job for project small residence with these uh, black mangroves that are just beautiful and the, and the red mangroves were done by code are very low and they're not in that area mm -hmm. next this is i'm jumping back to the maya because it i've been influenced by others too and in the in the, in the, in the my senior wonderful in crete the, the way they work with stairs i love that area too this is again a chichen it's near the caracol and look at how the stairs it's very wide and it's the same riser tread but it's narrow and on some of the pyramids that i've seen it is a wonderful site called yashha down to near balis you just right across to the Belize border near Tukal, and but it's separate. Almost no one goes there. That's what the archaeologists have all told me. But it was it was nobody there when I was there. A big site, and it had pyramids that would do this. There'd be wide stairs, then narrow stairs, and then narrow stairs and narrow stairs, so that they look taller because they was playing. They were playing with perspective. Mm -hmm. If they stayed the same width all along, you'd have had perspective but not as extreme as they were playing with. They also played with. with the depth of the stairs. The depth too. as well. Yeah. And every, we all think of Maya stairs as being, you know, so tall you can hardly step right on them, step on them. There are some that way, definitely. Definitely but, the Egyptians. <laughs> well, but you can do it. If you're careful and you do it sideways, you can actually do it. They're mm -hmm. not on a step about three inches wide or the narrowest I've seen. Yes. But they also have some stairs that are seats. Yes and they're very spread out. So they're really for ceremonies, mm -hmm. for sitting on. So let's go to the next. This is one of the last jobs and it's a residence we did and you see the stair reference here, right? Next, this is an all wood large project we did. This is gonna be on the tour coming up soon too. But you can see how we're playing with that stair. That's not the main design element of the building. It was to work with the land, but this is a detail that I loved and I wanted to tie it in. And here the stair goes all the way up to this upper level, and then it comes over and it, re re it reaches right out into this, to the courtyard. Yeah, it continues. I mean, yeah, just, it's just like a continuation. the wood too. Exactly, it's everywhere, the wood is everywhere. Yeah. This is a wonderful building, it's in the Puk period. It's not far from one of my favorite sites, Ushmal. This is Sael, the palace there, that's just beautiful. Now, let's go to the next one here. Again, this is a project we did that looks very, you know, the sun's hitting only Sparta there, so it's a little flat. But this is a house we just finished again. I was a design architect, Leo Leonardi is the architect of record. It's, a, it's not a residence. It's not residential scale at all. This is a, a palace or a mansion. It's a big property. It goes from beach to bay. It's about two acres. So it's a lot of land and it's a big, big building. 
and is designed to work on this land and use the site to the maximum. It's got about 200 feet of golf frontage. Let's go to the next image. And that's an, a drone shot of it. So you can see that we broke the building. So because it is so big, we broke it into two chunks and connected it with an air conditioned bridge. And the back side of this building, if you think of a seashell, the hard side of a seashell, and then everything facing the water is glass. And it's two stories with a ground level gym and some other areas on the ground level. But it's basically two living levels, a ground level, and a roof terrace. This was before you put the spiral staircase in, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. Elizabeth had been here, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Under construction. Under construction. Under yes. a number of you from the Art Center were good enough to go down there with me. That yeah, was great. It, it was a, a great adventure. I mean, just to see the house as as the floor. As it processing. Yes. Yeah. And again, this is the entry side. You go up a really a sand dune. Mm -hmm. These very I don't know if the stairs were there. Were they there when you were there? The stairs were there. Okay, but I don't know but the, the sand. Lands, the landscaping wasn't. Yeah, well, yeah. we did the landscaping, and that's changing, obviously. In fact, within a, within three years, you won't see the house on the road. We brought in banyan trees and all kind of trees, so the house will be totally not there. And it's colored beach sand, mm -hmm. so it will blend in. And so let's go to a couple more images. That's an image you all have seen before, right? This is the stair, <laughs> it's a staircase. And if it's not making any sense, if you look on the left side, you'll see a handrail. That will give you the clue. This is a stairwell going up in that mansion on the beach that we're just looking at. And there's a skylight that's above us still on another level. So it's, it's, a, it's a piece of sculpture that. And we were playing with making that wall area where the circulation all occurs heavy. So the weight of that with this, again, not, no windows, but some skylights, with that heavy wall, it would contrast with the glass. Mm -hmm. So you feel this. You don't need to think about it, but you know there's a contrast. And you use the spiral interiors. We have. Like ideas within this structure multiple times. We did. There are other subtle areas. There's a place with the ballet room, yes. and the wall is really a wave. Yes. It's a wave. And this is the view from that all glass side, and everything behind you is solid. Mm -hmm. We're almost done. I want to take you to one of my favorite, favorite Maya sites. Are we okay? Yeah, we're doing good. Okay. This is a site, a very small site. It's uh, not far from Ushmal. It's back in the bush. And there's a little sign. And to get there, I had my rental archaeology truck that I often rent when I'm there. And I was told by an architect, yeah, it's a site you'd like to see. So I went there. And I got routed to somebody's backyard with the pigs and the chickens. And, but it was a sign to say to go there. And I went there. And it's called Chukmuchun. And the big circle is the main city. And B and C are estates, basically noble estates that would have been. This one's probably a mile and a half. C is probably a mile and a half from A. Now, did they have actual, like, did they have roads or pathways? They or? had roads they called. There's a special name that I... <laughs> There's a special name for their roads, and they're all over. Yeah. And and they're they call them white ways, mm -hmm. and they are raised because of the land often will flood. They have rains like we have, and uh, land is low like we have. Yes. So a lot of those things. There's a name for the roads, and Sakbe I think is the right word. Okay. It means white way, mm -hmm. and there are roads. A lot of the cities connect with those. I mean, huge distances. These are not, these are, I don't know if there were sack bays here or not, but these are separate places. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, let me just say, I'd been to another site with a whole group of archaeologists, and it was in the afternoon, a really hot summer day, about three years ago, the first time, I've been here three or four times now. Mm -hmm. I've taken my, both of my sons and their families to this site, and both of my grandsons love the site. They love sea especially. Sea <laughs> see is up on a hill, about uh, a four, five story hill. And you walk it through, through a cornfield to get there. It's definitely but an estate. It's above. This is an, this <laughs> this is an, this that's amazing. See, but I'm mainly going to talk about A. Okay. So hopefully you will all have a chance to go to the site. And it's not advertised. They did have a guard there when I went there the first time. He was listening to his radio, and he had his feet up, and he was basically asleep in his truck. So I had to open his, you know, bang on the truck truck, truck door to let him give me a ticket. And then he went back to sleep listening to the radio. <laughs> and I had the whole site to myself. Again, A is, the, is what I want you to see. These are drawings that Thomas got me from the Peabody uh, Institute.
that I couldn't find any books. These other buildings are much further away. So this is 1927. 1927, when the Peabody is, is it Peabody? Uh, yeah, Peabody, Museum Peabody Museum did the studies here. And that's been reconsolidated a bit, but not a great lot. But I want to show you one specific thing about the site. And let's go back just a minute, yeah. Elizabeth. Sure. Is each of these, this building to the bottom is very like the Palace of Sayal, a bit more calm than that, but it's still very beautiful. One of my sons really liked that. I had a hard time getting away from that to go up the hill to the other one, <laughs> which they then like better. This is the one that's up on like a five-story hill. That is staggering. When I went there, I had never seen anything about the site. I simply saw the sign and the archaeologist said, yeah, it's a nice site, you'll like it, go there. And I went. And I didn't even know, they didn't have any foot handouts or anything. I was walking around and the, I, I saw part of this building. From, from the city center, which is the big A. Mm -hmm. So I walked up this hillock and it's like I say, five stories high and it's amazing. I mean, it's totally amazing. And it's got layers of building. It's not just what you're seeing there. It's not a lot of building, but you can easily have had smoke or fire signals from there to the main center that's a mile and a half away. This is all in a little valley, this whole area. But these were probably noblemen's estates here. The main city is there. Now, what I wanted to show you, Ushmo, uh, Chakmutun, sorry, Chakmutun, what it is I want to show you that is to show you the staircase. And let's go to the next image. This is a large courtyard. And the way I saw this, and I think it's a way often to see art and architecture, is to be very tired and don't focus, be out of focus so that you just kind of get things without forcing them and just letting them come to you on their own. It was a hot day and I'd been to the site, the first time there. And this is site A. This is site A, the city, exactly. Mm -hmm. And this main city is on the upper level there, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's, this, it's, the, it's the getting there. Yeah. It's the choreographing of how you move on a site. And it I is, think that's a great word, choreograph. It, it's an important word. Yes. And it's, it's in, I think it's important to architects. I think it's important to sculptors too, is how you move around a, a yes. piece of sculpture. And here, I was hot, I was tired after going to the other, and I was about ready to go. And I said, something's really strange here. I don't get it. And I remember sitting on these steps, and I was taking some pictures, and I've been back later three or four times <laughs> different t to see the site. I've taken other photographs. But I, there was a small ball court, ball court over here, and I've been told by archaeologists that often ceremonial choreographed entries to cities, even small cities, would be through the ball court. So I knew that this was probably part of the processional way to go to this sacred part of the city. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting on these steps, and they were all at angles, like a, a 45 degree angle or something. And then next image. This is like a first level. And then there's more steps. And then you see there's a tall set of steps in the distance. Stay on this for a moment here. Mm -hmm. These are all grown in the Maya. There would have been no trees here. Yeah. They put their lime finish over the whole pavement. They did not have trees. They kept trees out of these. And in a few sites that's happened, but the archeologists say they've left trees because the Mexican government says that if there are no trees, it's so hot, the tourists won't come. <laughs> so you've got a, a cycle. So here. these would have been painted. These would have been painted white. Probably. If they were lime. Or, or they were lime raw, or lime. They ground up the lime in the earth mm -hmm. to make this cement. Yeah. So they would have been either painted or they would have been the, the raw lime raw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've read so many places that everything was painted by the Maya, this rust color red, blood red almost, rust red but that's not what they're now finding. There were yeah. other colors and they use stones often natural. Yeah. This is a very red stone in this area. Mm -hmm. But let, let me tell you, this is the stair. So I looked at this stair, started studying it. I spent probably an hour trying to figure out what the what's going on here. And then next, this is the staircase going up to the main part of the city. And again, I wanted to see some drawings. I didn't have anything to look at from or nothing. And so, if you look at this, and it's hard with these photographs, but it looks like that stair is going up. It looks like this wall here is growing out of that stair. Well, that wall goes on for 200, 300 feet, and the ground drops off as you go along. So that wall that looks like it's growing straight out of that, go to the next image, I think this will help. That wall looks like it's doing what my red line is there. 
It's not doing that. Go to the next image. The wall is doing that. <laughs> now, what they are doing, I'm convinced, and I've talked with archaeologists about it, and some of them think I'm crazy, some think I'm really right on, is the Maya were playing with their with the sense of perspective. Mm -hmm. People would come to the staircase expecting it to be one way, and because the risers are so so high here, you can actually do that and get away with it. Go to the next image. Yeah. So you, you can see it doesn't line up, and you think it does. It's so subtle, and I've mentioned this to a psychologist friend, and they said, you know, this is playing with your mind. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to these again. These two or three slides. It's play. That's fine. Is playing with your sense of perspective and perception. You know things happen a certain way by living in the world. And then when you change that, you're throwing your sense of perception off. And you're thereby either liberating or confusing or celebrating the natural world of people. Because it's not all perfect. I, I choose celebrating. So. I think it is yeah. celebrating. <laughs> okay, let's go back through those. And just that's the, that's that's go back a moment, please, Liz. This is what it looks like clearly. Next, this is what it is. And if you'll hold on just a minute, mm -hmm. these drawings you can see the, the the crude black lines. Those are my drawings. What Tomas was able, the archaeologist was able to get me from the Peabody was this drawing with no stair. So for the archaeologists who saw this, they could care less about the procession. They could care less about the stairs. They were concerned about the buildings. I was looking at the procession. Well, it's also interesting how this is all kind of like it, it is that choreographing that it is up right it in is. the center. It is. It is. So there's so many layers. But what got me was the stair. It is so obvious when you look at it. The, it's not a mistake. I mean, you wouldn't have done a mistake this way. No. Okay. No. Okay. So that's it. And then this last image is that's where you can see them. This is the wall that continues several hundred feet. That's the stair. And you get down here, you can see them very clearly on different angles. Mm -hmm. Thank again, you. That's your knife edge. That's it. It's, <laughs> a, it's a knife edge again. It's again playing with nature and it's with architecture and with sculpture to me. Yeah. It's really to let you see the wonder of nature. It's to let you you open your eyes to things that you didn't see that way before. Well, and we were talking about this yesterday when you came in and we were yeah. looking at the sculptures, how we were trying to fix, turn things around. And you were like, I want to be able to see right through that. Yeah, through it. Yeah. Exactly. But again, nature is a wonder and that we should all have that opportunity and use it yes. to explore it exactly. constantly. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you, Carl. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. So next salon is going to be on November 13th. Uh, the topic is to be announced. I think it's going to be photography. I have to get um, that confirmed with Simone. And um, we are always looking for presenters and topics. And Carl was kind enough to be the speaker for this one. Thank you for tying it into the mod. That's great. Know. It just like kind of fell into place. It's fake. I, I <laughs> love how that happens. Yes. Um, if anyone spontaneity, <laughs> serendipity, serendipity. Yes. There you if go. anyone uh, is interested in being a presenter or has a topic to suggest, um, please email me at. Elizabeth at artsarasota.org. Um, you can be a presenter or I can present the topic. I'm looking for artists and anything you're interested in. Um, and if you have enjoyed our online salon to art and our other virtual programming, please consider donating to Art Center Sarasota. There is donate pages all over the website. Um, and or you can just, you know, send us money. We're happy to take that too. But please, um, we would like to and we are planning on continuing this online programming salon happens once a month. We have a weekly um, artist uh, happy hour on Thursday at six and a book club that is discussing how to be an artist right now by Jerry Saltz every Monday. We are on chapter 26. Six or 25 now, which is pretty cool. It's been going on for a while. And again, check out Explore. It is our online programming for Art Center Sarasota. And thank you so much. And don't go away just yet. We're going to do discussion. You guys ready for question and answer time? I'm going to stop sharing my screen.
and we will open it up for questions. Please remember that uh, I can see you all and that <laughs> you need to just raise your hand if you have a question or you can type it into the chat box and I will totally, uh, you know, let you know. Does anyone have any questions for Carl? Yep. Oh, Brianna, you can unmute yourself. Um, I had a question. Um, as an architect, do you live in a home that you built yourself or do you live in a home that someone else built? Okay, who am I looking at? This is Brianna right here. Oh, yes. I'm in a very <laughs> old, I'm in, a, in a, almost a 90 year old building that I've certainly modified a lot and is totally covered with vines and trees. So it's basically the building is not there. But it, the space <laughs> isn't there, but the building is, it, every room is now looking outside in a way that it never was before. So it's been very modified. I've done studies for buildings for my, myself and my sons when they were very young. We never got them done. But, you know, and it's a very hard thing for an architect to do his own building. And I've always found that. I've heard that and, and known that through architect friends. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, that's exactly what I was curious about. Because I was like, at, living in your own work, I can imagine, I, I, thinking about that, I wasn't well, sure. Well, let, let me just add something to what you just said is Leslie, who's on our web somewhere. I don't see you, Leslie, but I think you're there. Uh, she was. Le there. Leslie <laughs> and Steve were so great. We did the house. You saw the one, I think you saw Butterfield, the house it was a floating house that was related to a pyramid truncated form. Uh, they gave me their house for a week, which was what, right, great. I mean, so I saw it in a very different way. And the house is what, three years, four years old. And it's a great honor to be able to go into a project that you've done and spend some time because often the first uh, part of my time when I go to any building is looking around and see if they work, see if things work, not letting them come to me, but me checking them out. And so when you're there for a number of days, like I was able to be, you can start let the building talk to you instead of you checking it. So, it is true what you said. It's a it's an honor to be able to be in your own building. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, Kelly. Yes. Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi. Can I'm you hear me? Hearing. Can you turn it up? I can. I can. Can you? Hang on a minute, if you don't mind. This way. Kelly. Hi. So I had the pleasure, um, my husband and I, of being in the home that you built for Leslie and her husband Steve. Yes. And John. And John, right. And I was wondering, can you tell me one of the challenges that you had in designing the home? And two part question, did you pick the location or did they pick the location and then came to you? No, okay, good question. Okay, is Leslie still on? I think she went out. Okay, no, no problem, but she could back me up is what I'm saying, or, or check me out. No. <laughs> Uh, they picked the site, definitely. Okay. And let me tell you what I understand. They, there was a house on the lot, and you yeah. know the lot well. Some of you, some of you others know the lot or know, know the Butterfield Project. They're 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 amazingly generous, showing having the house open for tours, and and it's going to be on the mod, a walk around the building. So anyway, but they had picked the site, and they had had a house that was there demolished. And what I understood was later they found that the house had been built before the codes were so strict so to build a new building on that site was extremely restrictive because you have water on two sides in the city that's 30 foot and the big thing is on the south side where you enter the building kelly you remember yeah. the other side that's a platted roadway a platted platted roadway somewhere between 30 and 50 i'd say about 50 feet and then there's a 30 foot setback from that. Wow. So the south side of that building is right dead on the setback. It's a huge setback. When you go to the site, nobody believes that. The road is not closed. It is a deeded, unimproved roadway. And as I remember, and I think I'm correct here, Leslie could correct me, obviously, is they had planned to, when they, tore down the building, they were really concerned they'd ever, ever be able to build anything on it because the setbacks were so extreme. Now this is getting into your first question, 
what was the most restricting? It was the setbacks. It was this very long, narrow footprint that was buildable. And you wouldn't think that to see the land, but it's very narrow. And so they were in the process, as I understand, before they got it, before they were going to select an architect, of getting the road closed. And they were talking with an attorney, a friend of mine, and it looked like it was going to be hard to get that closed because of some of the city commissioners who were very anti closing black platted roadways. And um, so I talked with Leslie and Steve and John, and I said, you know, I do think we could make a building work even with these very restrictive setbacks. And so they hired us to do some rough studies. We did, and that's what we did. But the setbacks were a huge challenge on that. And yes, working with the view lines, because you have water in three directions when you're up high, and it's how do you pick? And we pick what I think is the most important, which is to the winter sun and to the Gulf. Now, also from that building, you see that amazing building of Rudolph's, the, the uh, cocoon, which is a world icon. And we wanted to see that, and that's my mentor. So I wanted to see the building, but I didn't want to stare at it. So you see it, the pool on Zion access to it on the ground level, but the main room is looking the other direction. So does that answer you? It does, thank you. Yeah. Check it out with Leslie and see if she says the same. Okay. Well, and that was something that when you did the tour that you did mention when we did the tour of the most recent project is that you do take into consider the privacy and the oh, view. Yeah. So when you had, okay, so the wall goes so far so that you can't actually see the properties next door. Right. Um, right. We and did it, that. Yeah, we did that a lot. And you and, take that into consideration. Oh, yeah. And with our roof really terrace cool. on that big estate which we're calling the Gulf of Mexico State. With that, we plan to put a solar roof on the tallest roof. And we did not want to see it from the roof terrace, which is on the other building. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason that built that wall between the two building forms is higher. Uh, okay. I think I've never told that to Jan and Elliot, who've been there several times with me. But 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 that's a part of the re that's part of the reason for that big curve. Mm -hmm. It's also to sweep your view out to the Gulf. Yes. But it's also to block what's on the roof because the solar roofs are not very good looking. <laughs> you know, and they're great to have, but they're not what you want to see when you're on a roof terrace. They're, they're getting better now. They've got. I, I agree. I agree. Um, we had a question which was uh, from Henriette. So it was, uh, Carl, I'm interested in, uh, in knowing how nature became so grounded in your passion for architecture or the other way around. Well, uh, my immediate, without thinking, my, quite, my answer to that is I started to go into art and sculpture. And then the next direction was landscape. And when I went to University of Florida, I was in landscape architecture. And the first years at University of Florida in those days was landscape architects and architects were the same courses. And I really discovered architecture. I didn't know architecture what it really was. I was amazingly naive. I still am, but I was really naive then. And I didn't know what was the difference between an architect and a builder and a builder. But I knew as a little kid, I had loved being in certain buildings like my aunt's mansion. What a mansion it was a big house, a clone pre, you know, pre-Civil War. Well, for a little kid, it's every, every big house is a mansion. Well, okay, but, it, but, but I, I, I appreciated the sense of big spaces and the way that they're articulated and they work with nature and that mansion, that big house did work with nature very beautifully. But I've always had this fascination with, with animals and plants and trees and when they bloom and the season. And I was teaching at University of Florida not long ago, well, I was in at Yale teaching and I asked the students, that was a number of years ago, what trees are blooming outside? It was in the spring and not a single student knew. And I did the same thing at University of Florida, the dogwood blooming, just great and the pink bud all in Gainesville. Not a single student in that class had, had seen what was blooming as they walk into the building. So it's a thing of, and I'm not meaning this is anti-architectural students, it's just that we don't, most all of us are so busy, we don't see the world around us. And there's amazing beauty in the world around us. There's also non-beauty around us, but there's enough beauty around us that, 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 that you want to make it a focus if you can. And I, I think the Sarasota School of Architecture 
architects actually took that into consideration oh, yeah. because the the tree of gold that is outside of yeah. the art art center and another a, a number of our very mature trees yeah. that are in the garden right. have been there since the beginning of the of the building i know the that gold tree that specific gold tree when i was at the university of florida yes and i came here for a convention in the exhibition hall when i was a student and i saw that mm -hmm. tree and there's one at the railing too gold yeah. tree this this tree here, we have had arborists come in, master arborists, and they look at it and they're just like, this is the most beautiful yeah. example of this species. It's a beautiful tree. Yeah, it is. And it's, it, it's the way it curves and yeah. it works perfectly. And the trees are using that word choreographs. The mm -hmm. bomb backs are January, February, soon after that of Jack Randall's, and yes. right after that the time they quit is the gold tree, Tabby Villiers. So this beautiful like choreographing of flowering trees that we have that you can't grow in Tampa. You got the monkey puzzle tree too. Those ones well, that's cool. interesting, but that's not <laughs> amazing. Not to me. Okay. Okay. Only Selby has that one. But uh, yeah. we had another question uh, from Kathy Moon as to where did the fascination with blue come from? Somebody, Ambry Russell asked me not long ago that, and I had to think about that. And I said, you know, I think it was blue iris. Because when I was a kid, my mother had a whole lot of blue iris, and there was a swamp near where we, you know, in the town, little town where we lived. And we used to go out in the spring and pick the wild, they call them wild flags. We have them in Mayaka here. Yeah. And I love that color. So, and I've been in my, the summer house restaurant ceiling is blue. It's not quite as intense as that. But in, in the auditorium at Pineview, which is 27 years old, the whole auditorium is blue. The, I don't know what it is now, but the walls are all blue. The ceiling is blue. The seatings, everything was blue. And the stage was a kind of a gold because their colors were blue and gold. Yes. So, but we, but I've always liked blue. Mm -hmm. So I think it's nature, it's it's water, it's all these things. Well, you know, it, it also goes back to, you know, the sky. It's the sky. The sky, you yeah. know. It's, yeah. it's what the, the, the Maya and the Native peoples in the Americas that they traded with. Too. The sacred color of the Maya is a blue. Yeah. It's a bit more of a green blue. It is, a, yes. But it is a blue. Mm -hmm. And I always have learned love lapis. And lapis can be many shades, as yes. you know. I like turquoise, but they're not nearly as important to me in color as the lapis and the, and the, and the, and the, and the cobalt. Yeah, more metallic -y ones. All right, let's see, what else? We had, Carl, is your reference from the Peabody Museum a reference from the one at Yale? I don't really know. There's a Peabody Museum at Yale, there's one at- um, There's one in Connecticut. At, on video. I think there's one at Columbia, am I right? Help me. Whoever asked the question, help me. <laughs> well, I, I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> there are a number of Peabody well, Carl, at Yale, Burns, uh, Richard Berger was very active in both Maya, Machu Picchu, and so forth. We went to Yale, we went to Machu Picchu with him. So I'm assuming Great. it was the Yale. The and what Yale was his name? Richard Berger. Okay. The, when, the, when we were at Yale. Yeah. The, I, I, I don't know which, uh, Tomas Galarata Negro was the archaeologist who got those drawings from me. I don't know which Peabody they came from, but I do want to say this. Uh, a, a gentleman named Michael Coe, who's been, he, he died in late eighties, uh, last year, I think. And he was at Yale forever. And um, I had been in communication with him via uh, email. And he, when I would go to different sites, I would ask him and other archeologists, which site should I go to? And I was in Guatemala. I was gonna spend almost two weeks down there going to Copan and. Kitigua and some of the other sites, many of the other sites, and there was some that Michael Coe said, don't get near that site. They aborted, they, they, they fixed it up for the tourists. It's awful, don't go near that. But he was there, and so Yale has a very powerful Yale uh, 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 Maya study program. I didn't realize that when I was at Yale. I really did not. In fact, when we were at Yale, I gotta tell you, Paul Ruder kept uh, the 15 of us so busy we hardly left the building. I mean, it was like <laughs> it was like one year nonstop. So I really didn't know what was happening at Yale. I wouldn't have known even. I got there the year Rudolph left. I had more for the first year. Sorry? I said, I got there the year Rudolph left. You guys were gone. Yeah, you got Charles Moore then. 
I had Charles Moore for the first year. Charles Moore. This is yeah. um, he graduated up from Yale in 67. Yeah, I was there in 62. I graduated in 62. Wasn't Charles Moore there when you were there? Uh, yeah, he'd be, that was his first year. Your first year? Yeah, well, yeah. Let, me, let me just comment. When I was up at Yale, oh, and I don't know, about eight or 10 years ago, I was on a panel with, Lord, with Norman Foster and Richard Rogers, my close, close classmates at Yale. But I asked, because Bob Stern was the dean then, I knew Bob pretty well, fairly well, because he was an undergraduate, I was at Yale. And I asked, where are the projects that were putting the, the student morgue? And that's a strange name, but what they would do is they would, when you do projects, each person would do individual projects. I'm sure you will know what I mean, but I'll tell the other people here. And one or two projects which we kept out of each group of projects that were done, put in the morgue to be saved, saved basically forever. And I was fortunate to have several projects put in the morgue. And my friend Norman Foster did too. And Norman and I were asking Bob Stern, is there a way we could see what's in the morgue? And what he said, when Charles Moore became Dean after Rudolph, he hated Rudolph so much and everything about Rudolph, he burned everything in the morgue. What? Oh, ridiculous. Oh, no. so, Maybe that was my stern line never got along too well after it. So Mr. Mr. Moore is another world, okay, in terms of architecture. I don't disagree at all. Uh, he and I didn't get along very well. I, said, I don't disagree at all. Even okay, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Good. <laughs> Have any of no, the Maya sites? Have, have some of no, you been to Maya through, sites? Uh, through Scully and through the Peabody, yes. Sorry? Through Scully and through the Peabody, yes. And then we went down to Machu Picchu. But you the went in sites, Machu, I, well, you, with the Peabody, you went to what sites in the Yucatan, in, in the Maya world? We went to Machu Picchu. Then I uh, just studied through Scully the other stuff. Yes, okay. I said, you knew Scully. Scully's amazing, <laughs> totally yeah. amazing. But Machu Picchu's in South America, right? Correct. Right, right. But in any case, did have any of you others who are on the link with us been to the Yucatan? I've uh, been to the Maya world. It's not just the Yucatan. Oh, Donna. What, what sites have you been to? Yeah, you're you're muted still, Donna. Uh, the sites. I see your hand there doing something. There. Yeah, I moved to uh, uh, Machu Picchu and Chichen Itza and Nuxmal and. I think some other places. Yeah, there's one that's on the coast that many people who go on cruises, they go to Tulum, and Tulum's a very small, beautiful site, but it's been totally overridden by, by tourism, much worse than Chichen. Chichen is a wonderful site, and one of my favorite, favorite sites is Uxmal. That is an amazing site, amazing site. And if you haven't been there, as you who've heard me, before talk about the Maya world. From Miami, it's an hour and a half flight to Merida. Closer than Atlanta. If you go from Miami to Merida and draw a line on the map and Miami to, Ma Miami, Miami to Atlanta, Mer Merida is closer. You're in a whole nother world. So, so Carl, is, are you saying you're gonna be our tour guide? To no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a very bad tour guide because I, when I go to these sites, Sometimes I go very fast, and other times I'll just sit for hours in one spot and, and do sketches or whatever, just look at it. Mm -hmm. So that would bore, it's bored. It, <laughs> when I went with my sons and then my grandchildren a couple of su summers so ago, I didn't do it the, my way. I did it their way. Their way. And went to sites I'd been to. And it wasn't fun, was it? Well, it wasn't the way I would do it. Right. It was okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a, a good guide, you know, at all. I don't think that would really work. And I've had some good guides, mm -hmm. and I've been very fortunate through my archaeology friends to know where to get a truck, where to get a driver when I need a driver, um, what my hotels to stay in. I mean, this wonderful guy, Alfonso, who has this agency that rents trucks, vehicles, whatever, and sets up tours basically for students mm -hmm. and, and archaeologists. Yeah. And Alfonso, sometime I go on a site when I was going to. Uh, Copan, which is a long trip. So they would pick me up at four in the morning or something, the driver. Well, Alfonso said, you can't drive that. It's too dangerous. You've been on a lot of these trips. You cannot drive that. I will not rent you a beagle. He's in another country, Guatemala. He's in Mexico, but he had you know, connections. Yeah. And then when I got to the motel at night, he said, how was the driver? I said, he was okay. He didn't speak much English, but I don't think he didn't speak any Spanish. And he said, I know he was late finding you and they didn't pick you up at the airport. 
And he said, I'm getting you another driver. Because I was going to stay at the site a couple of days and the driver was going to come pick me up. He had another driver come pick me up. So the people have been so supportive and so thoughtful and so, well, supportive is the right word, I think. Yeah. And kind. Yes. And just amazing. Both the American archaeologists and the, um, the, the Mexican archaeologists have been wonderful. I mean, I, I love the fact that you, you you prefer to go to the ones that people don't know, that haven't been well, tourist Well, not, not necessarily. Yeah. Uxmal is a very known site, and it's still one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. If you had to pick one site that's easy to get to and that's wonderful, it's Uxmal. Okay. But there are others that are amazing. And and Tomas has said this. He says, you get really excited about these, don't you? And I said, yeah. He said, you want to go tomorrow to a, to a, to a ski shmur? He said, I haven't been there in about a year. And he said, uh, it's part of my territory, so I need to check it out. And he said, we can do it tomorrow. He yeah. said, it's not on my schedule. I said, wonderful. <laughs> so we spent the whole day. That was several years ago. Yeah. So I've been very, very lucky, very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Good. Carol, thank for you. Sharing. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, everyone. Yay. And we will hopefully um, check out uh, the mod weekend and it's definitely worth it. Get the tickets now before they sell out. And, um, and we will see you at the art center when we have our show. Yeah. Let me just add to that. Yeah, yeah. What you're okay. right is because everything, because this bizarre world we're all in, yes. everything has been very choreographed, to use that word again, yeah. so that we all stay very safe doing the mod. Uh, you'll be dis distancing your, your, with the driving tours. You are, get a ticket for a certain time of the day to start your tour so that there aren't too many people in one place at a time. Yes. And there are limiting tickets on everything. Yeah, we because are going to have only a certain amount of visitors every half an hour. Right. The same is going for um, the art museum. For art museum. Yeah, same, yeah. Yeah. And so every precaution is being made, but this means there will be limited access and it's just such a great honor this is happening. And thank you. It's yeah. great to be here. Oh, I know. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad we get to you know, have more of a talk. So. Good. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Take care.